So, I hope everybody enjoyed lunch. I did, uh, actually. Um, welcome back. This session will be in English because we have a um, guest from the United States who will be um, the keynote uh, speaker later this afternoon. So we are very excited that she's here. And um, so this session is called a, a food dialogue. And um, I'm a, I'm a, my name is Marcel Krok. I'm a science writer and I have organized a climate dialogue in the past. So when I was uh, involved in this, or in this organization, I said we should organize a food dialogue. There is a difference between a dialogue and a debate. A debate you always want to win. No matter how, you just want to win the debate. And a dialogue uh, at least supposes that you are really interested to listen in, the, in what the other has to say. So let's hope that our participants are really interested in what the other one has to say. I will first give the floor to Amber. She will talk for 10 minutes. There was a slight misunderstanding that um, um, we thought that, that both speakers had a short presentation, but she didn't realize. So she has no presentation, and so you can fully concentrate on what she has to say. Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, so I'm feeling a little bit guilty for having taken what I feel is a, an easier to defend position in this debate, and I, I commend your spirit for, for having taken what I think is a bit harder, and the reason I say that, um, and, and I'm open to you changing my mind, uh, but I think that my position is that there that there is no strong evidence that red meat is dangerous for your health. And so in order to defeat that position, you, you actually have to provide strong evidence that there's a danger um, to have a diet that includes meat versus one that doesn't. Um, and of course, I will start perhaps predictably with the, the idea coming from our evolution. So we have diverged from the line where chimps continued on um, some four to eight million years ago, depending on how you look at it. And all from the very beginning of that line, we had animal food, red meat included in our diet. Uh, and you might think that it was a small amount, right? Because if you look at chimps, um, they do they are known to eat some meat, uh, but it's a very small component of their diets. Whereas if you're looking at isotopic evidence, for example, even in the HOMO line, uh, we can see that the level of animal-based protein is not only high, but it's, it's higher than, than canids. It's higher than felids. <laughs> it's, we're considered top carnivores. And in fact, um, there was a recent press release from some, some scientists who were so um, perplexed by this data that th they wanted to try to figure out how it could even be possible that we were eating so much meat. Um, one of the authors said, um, an unreasonably huge amount of meat in our diet. So we're not talking about a small amount. Um, and what those researchers did come up with, though, is they, they were exploring the hypothesis that maybe we were eating some fermented meat, uh, which is quite plausible since we didn't have um, other me methods of preservation, and they were noticing that this putrefa uh, putrefaction process actually increases the traces of those proteins. Uh, but even if you take that into account and they're right that that's increasing, um, that might bring us back to the level of the canids maybe, and then we're still, we still have to consider that we were eating a lot of meat. So uh, to say that red meat is dangerous, you have to basically say that something that we've been adapted for, we've had two million years, say, between the first traces of when this was known to happen to agriculture to adapt to this process um, of eating red meat and say that this would uh, be dangerous for us. So obviously, um, we needed the nutrition for meat, and you can, of course, get many of your nutritional meats, even maybe all of them today, without eating meat, because we have technology that allows us to manufacture certain vitamins in different ways. Um, however, one of the reasons that I'm not 
compelled by the evidence so far that's been brought to bear in the dangers is the, the quality and the type of evidence. So the starting point, as far as I can tell, for the idea that red meat should be dangerous is by looking at epidemiological studies and saying, well, there's a difference between those who eat a lot of meat and those who eat a little bit of meat, and those who are eating a little bit are healthier than those who are eating a lot. Um, the problem with this, I think, is par partly quantitative. So if you have an association and your association between the high end and the low end is less than double, a lot of people consider that not even evidence. Uh, and I don't know that we have any evidence of this particular sort that is up to the level where you think this is really important and we should pay attention to it. So when you have a smaller amount of evidence like this, then you can say, well, what are the conflating factors? And some obvious ones might be, well, for the last 50 years or more, people have been told increasingly that they should not eat red meat. So the kind of people who eat low levels of red meat are more likely to be compliant in other health areas that actually may be having an effect. Um, so if we start looking at, at then mechanisms to explain why, uh, why red meat might actually be dangerous for us, we've already started uh, from a position that we know that it is dangerous and that we are trying to explain what that mechanism is. So it, when you phrase it this way and you're trying to find mechanisms, mechanisms can always be found, right? Uh, I can give you mechanisms why certain plant foods would be bad for you, but that they're only really powerful as explanations if the thing that you're trying to explain actually exists. And so I feel that if you have a, me a mechanistic explanation for something that we don't have strong evidence actually happens, then you're solving a problem that isn't an actual problem. Um, and so um, that is how I would transition into the um, evidence that Remco has presented about these two factors, uh, NOI5TC and TMAO, um, because the, and hopefully he will educate me on the state of the art in those particular mechanisms, but the ideas that I've seen that were developed on those start with, we know that red meat is bad for us, here's an idea of what might be causing that. So for example, um, NOI5GC is, is a mutation that happened before, I think it's at the time of Homo erectus. So first of all, that's very strange, right? At the time that our meat level started increasing, we've got a, ch a genetic change that the claim is would make eating red meat very unhealthy. So that's already very contradictory. Um, there are other animals that have this mutation. It's appeared in different independent lines. And most of them don't have diets that include a lot of red meat, but one of the groups of animals that has the same mutation are the, the muscolids. So that's, you know, weasels and ferrets and uh, those, those group of carnivorous animals. So if we're going to argue that this genetic change is something that indicates that re eating red meat is dangerous, then you have to explain how it could have come about just as we were transitioning to a higher and higher meat diet and how it could uh, have come about in a species that eats essentially nothing but meat. Um, similarly with TMAO, um, there is more, there are higher levels of TMAO in people who eat a strong fish diet than in people who eat a red meat diet. And so um, if you're going to use TMAO as an argument against red meat, you must also use it as an argument against fish. And even just from, a, from an epidemiological perspective, uh, last year, I don't know if it's still true this year, but last year I looked at longevity populations, who has the most, uh, and that would be uh, for men, Iceland, and their diet is very, very high in fish. And so if TMAO is causing a, a problem that would lead to shorter lives, then we already have a contradiction there. Uh, there was one more thing that I wanted to touch on that I found really interesting in Remco's uh, written presentation, and that was about the fact that the focus on hunting has been uh, 
a, a male dominated dominated way of looking at the science and I thought that was very interesting and there may be some truth to that um, but if you think about the the opposition of roles between hunting and gathering the gatherers it turns out have these very primitive tools where they're using a, a stone or something else to grind something and if you look back at the history of the, the grinding tool where we first find it is actually in Australopithecus where there was a, a gathering process that was actually an animal gathering of, of bones and of skulls where they use these same percussive tools to crack open brains and marrow. And so um, this is all speculative, cor of course, but perhaps the, the female role has been to gather, but what they were gathering before the crisis where we lost all the megafauna was actually also to get into animal-based nutrition. Uh, thank you, that's all I have. <laughs> Excellent, uh, well done in, uh, in time. Um, so our next, I, I forgot to really introduce Amber, but uh, that, that will be done later this afternoon before her keynote. Um, the second participant is uh, um, a member of our organization, uh, Remco Kuipers. Uh, you probably know him from his two books about, uh, uh, about uh, paleo diet, uh, Oerdiet and Oergezond. Um, Remco is a cardiologi cardiologist in training um, in the, at the OLVG in, um, uh, hospital in uh, Amsterdam. They do great work, I know, because uh, they, they did surgery on my knee and they did an excellent job, so um, he should be fine. Okay, are you ready? Okay, um, well, I'm going to argue why we should be careful with red meat consumption. And uh, I have actually five questions, you can see them here on the screen. Um, like Amber already told us, evolutionary importance of, meas, of meat is, in my opinion, somewhat uh, exaggerated, overestimated. I will argue that red meat does not add anything special. I will get back to that, of course. Red meat contains pro-inflammatory NOI5 G uh, GC. Red meat increases serum TMO. Well, I will show you some data. And then last but actually not least, red meat consumption will destroy our ecosystem and I think even our planet and humanity with that. So this is data I got from very old studies. This is uh, Lee and De Vore, that's a great symposium which was held in 1968 already where they showed that, well, we like to talk about hunting but actually when you see, uh, when you take a look at the success of hunters, well, the most of their subsistence, most of what they hunt, uh, Actually, they are not very successful at hunting. So they go out hunting and two in three times they get back with nothing. So our male hunters, they do hunting, but actually bringing back calories to their family, that's not, not, not very successful. Um, okay, you don't see the picture here. Well, what I see is a group of hunter-gatherers, a picture I made in Africa where they are sitting around the campfire. And that's actually where I heard most of the stories about hunting. They were always telling stories about the elephant they caught, the buffalo they hunted, the kudu they hunted. But when I was asking and asking more about it, they were always telling stories about actually their grandfathers who had heard it from another old man who had heard it from that older guy in that village far away. It was never their own stories. And all, when you asked, when I was there, when I was looking at what they were eating, they were eating what the women brought into the camps. And ah, there's the picture. And there's the next picture. So here you see what I think is the real base of where we evolved on. I fully agree that we were chimps and that at a certain moment there was a group of chimps which remains in the forest and there was a group of chimp likes which went out of the forest. There was actually at that time a climate change too. And they changed into humans. And why did they change into humans? Because they had changed their diet from mainly plant-based to mainly meat-based, but not red meat, I think that the, the way they built their brains was by eating what this woman was gathering or what, what maybe some men were even hunting. Shellfish, and I, shall, I will show you some evidence. 
this is why I say red meat doesn't, doesn't add anything. This is a beautiful um, illustration of what should you eat to have all the micro, micronutrients you, you need into your daily diet. Well, the most concentrated sources of what you need to be alive and to remain healthy are in shellfish. You see that you only need 900 grams of shellfish a day, which contains all the important ingredients, all the important micronutrients, and the most, well, the limiting nutrient is copper. Next are eggs. Well, you can imagine that eggs contain everything because, well, the infant bird has to grow on it. Then next is fish. Then next are pulses, cereals, and then there's only meat. And you have to eat a lot of meat to have all the healthy ingredients you need to stay, remain alive. Well, from, from, from a pure red meat diet, I think that's not a very good um, way of eating to, for example, build a brain. Because also we know that by eating red meat, you will eat a lot of arachidonic acid, which is pro-inflammatory. You cannot build a brain on it. Arachidonic acid actually is in a lot of other things, and you, you need to build your brain. There's also DHA in it, DHA, an omega-3 fatty acid, and you can only derive that from either eating brains of other animals. Well, the people who know, most need that are the pregnant women, and they are mostly not on the savannah hunting with the guys. And I know from personal experience, most of the times, they don't bring their giant zebra heads back to the campfire to feed brains to their wives. So yeah, chances of getting enough omega-3 fatty acids from a meat-based diet, a red meat diet, is, in my uh, opinion, uh, very low. Then there are actually trials with a paleolithic diet where they observed, they really measured uh, micronutrient deficiencies in people who were eating paleolithic diet and then mostly the translation of Lauren Cordain's the American paleolithic diet where he proposes that we eat a, have to eat a lot of meat and you see that they actually showed in their well in the urine that they, those people were eating too low concentration of iodine and you might think well what about iodine well iodine is very very important iodine is the most important micronutrient in the development of intelligence actually to build a brain, there are, you need brain nutrients, and that's not, not only DHA, as I was just mentioning, but it's also, also iodine, that's also zinc. And you will get iodine deficiency if you stop eating bread and if you stop eating fish. So I argue that red meat does not contain enough iodine to have made us from chimps to humans. So your IQ will, will decrease by about 10% about if your mother is iodine deficient during pregnancy. So will red meat give you enough iodine? I think not. You need to eat other sources and you don't need red meat actually for anything. You can get all those micronutrients, like I showed you in this sheet, much easier from non-red meat sources of protein. Then, of course, this one, well, this is what is mostly told in other uh, places. Red meat, there are, this is, of course, this is, this is epidemi epidemiological, this is observational, where you see that the people, the more red meat they eat, the higher their chances of all kinds of diseases, ease of ex even of accidents. Well, that, of course, has, has to do with, um, well, total risk. And like Amber said, we need more causality. And I agree with that. There are no strong studies, no randomized clinical trials with replacement. So I can only see and show you that there are some, well, um, foodstuffs which have been associated with higher risk of death or of cardiovascular death. And even in this case with NOI5GC, higher chances of, of inflammation, which has been shown in laboratories, and higher um, chances of cancer, which has been shown in laboratories, and even higher concentrations of this NOI5GC uh, NOI in uh, cancer cells. So this is only association, I know that. But it means for me that if there is a lot of data showing that red meat might increase, there are some mechanisms and the addition of there is no need to eat red meat, I would argue, why should we eat red meat? It doesn't add anything and all the evidence we have is that it's not, it's not protecting you in any way for any kind of disease. You could eat for a much better reason, other sources of protein, so birds and fish. Well, on the TMAO, well, like Amber said, also the studies are not very, very well, but these have been published in Nature Medicine and the New England Journal of Medicine, and here they have 
observe the large cohort of people. So although indeed Iceland people might have high levels of TMAO, well this is the observational data where they showed the highest incidence of cardiovascular disease is in those people with the highest level of TMAO. And of course TMAO also derives from eating fish. But yeah, like I said and like Jaap Seidel told us this morning, food is a matrix. You need of, we eat a lot of things and apparently there is some protective thing in fish which might compensate for the in, uh, risk increasing TMO in fish. And then we get to the last and for the last I will be very quick but I have to show you some things. I think red meat consumption will destroy our ecosystem. Why? Well the earth has only a certain amount of surface and just a part of it like one third is land and not all of those land we can grow crops or we can have cattle. It's about 33% of this 150 million square kilometers we can use, so about 50 kilometers and already one third, so of this, this 33 is here, so one third of the 50 squared million kilometers is, is already in use and some people even tell us that's the most fertile part, so we don't have any, anything left. But let's assume we have like 22% left, so two thirds left. There are new, now two and a half billion people and a lot of cattle already. And now let's get to the thing. Why do we need to conserve some ecosystem? Well, first of all, we know that from Japanese studies to be in the, well, in the nature will reduce our blood pressure and another lot of risk factors. Then this guy, it's not all about ourselves. This is an ego tripper, well, 100%. But I think we need to be sustainable and we need to share any, everything equal. And look at the color of the hands. I think that we would have to realize that we are eating a lot of meat and if we want to have all those other people eating healthy red meat, which might be a suggestion, then we have to give them the opportunity to eat, to eat as much red meat as we do. And I will show you the consequences. Right now, to have enough red meat for all of us to eat in the current amounts of meat we eat now, we have one billion cows. If we allow the other people, and that's one third of the fertile land, if we allow all those Asians and Africans and the continuing population growth, then there will be 86 um, kilograms of meat intake per person per year as well in those countries, and we will have tripled our amount of cows and so the amount of well, available land on this planet. So there is not enough land to grow all those crops and to have all those cows walking around. So maybe some people suggest we go to Mars. I think that's a very best, bad suggestion. I would love to show these animals to my children and not having cows walking around everywhere because now there's a mega extinction coming on and we will be in a cow planet where some of us can walk in between cows. Well, I'm not interested in that and I don't like this guy. I suggest open population should be stopped and you see that if we stop overpopulation those amounts stay equal we are not growing any more people we would get like China does have uh, birth control in all over the world and we would all increase our meat intake then still a lot of if everybody starts eating red meat we will have a big increase in cows and so a big decrease in nature and in wild animals well another solution would be nuke Asia well, that's what Trump is suggesting, that's not my suggestion. I would suggest we all share everything equal. So we reduce our intakes of meat. And in this case, with a growing population, that already all, only doubles the amount we will be eating. But the best solution would be this one. We stop the in enormous increase in population in this world and we halve our intake of meat and then we end up with well, only a little increase. So that would be my, my suggestion. I would, well, if you want to help the population to decrease, we could eat more Chinese, that 1.4 1 billion of them, but maybe, yeah, another way around is having not eating more cows, but eating their organs, which contain higher concentrations of calories, so we can still reduce the amount of cows around the world. But my final suggestion would be, go back in evolution, see how we change from apes to humans that was by eating more uh, marine source proteins and I think like two-thirds of the earth is underwater we can still use those lands to grow more and more foods to have uh, enough protein intake and in a healthy way. Thank you. Thanks. Really interesting. Um, so um, 
I will hand over the microphone to Amber uh, for a short reaction and then maybe only three minutes, yeah? Uh, because he, 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 he introduced a lot of uh, arguments. Um, and then again, Remco will also join. And then after that, uh, I will hand over the microphone to the, to the audience as well. Yeah, so three minutes. Okay, phew, that was a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> so what should I respond to most urgently? Um, the idea that red meat doesn't add very much. Um, I, I think that it would be a mistake to think of only uh, nutrients in isolation. For example, red meat is often thought of as just a protein source. Uh, even though I agree it's true that we can get many of our nutrients from other sources, there are things that I think are not um, appreciate it as much as they could be, for example, taurine and actually carnitine, even though I understand that there is an idea that carnitine is contributing to this uh, TMAO problem, uh, these kinds of nutrients are underappreciated and actually contribute a lot to our health. Um, in, on the TMAO data, uh, there is some evidence that actually it's endogenously created TMAO that does not come from uh, carnitine in the diet and in fact it increases when you are carnitine deficient so that's something to look into. Um, about stories exceeding reality, um, I would suggest that maybe this has to do with the fact that everywhere that humans have gone they have um, caused massive extinctions in the megafauna and so perhaps it was only people's great-grandfathers who were able to do such good hunting but it doesn't necessarily mean that if you don't have the resources today that we didn't have them then. Um, on iodine deficiency, one thing that's really interesting about iodine is that it's used in the production of thyroid and if you're not eating a high carb diet, your thyroid needs go down to somewhere between a half and two thirds of their original values. There is a paper by uh, uh, somebody, Kopp, uh, recently who suggested that we actually had iodine uh, sufficiency until we went to a higher carb diet and that this uh, iodine deficiency has been created by uh, too much carbohydrate in the diet. Um, finally, I deeply agree with you that I want to have a sustainable planet and um, I, I don't necessarily agree that um, not eating red meat is a solution to that problem. We have so much land that is actually only usable by uh, grazing animals because it can't grow crops but it can grow grass. And on that a similar point, um, much, much of the crops uh, that are grown for humans, say corn for example, we eat the tiny kernel and the cattle eats the rest. So it's, it's not even, otherwise this would go to waste. You can even feed food waste to, to pigs for example. Um, so it's, it's not either or, and in fact, we, there may be efficiencies gained by, by having both kinds of agriculture. Uh, I agree also that we should use more of the cow. Uh, one of the things that I think is a great tragedy is the fat that's being thrown away because we talk about this need to grow crops for energy. So if we're getting all our energy from wheat, what if we actually use the fat that my butcher is throwing away day after day to get energy? Will we need as much wheat and will we get, a, get our cattle to go a lot farther? Um, but I also think that human health needs to come first. Um, if you're getting, if you're not getting your protein from red meat, are you going to destroy the fisheries? Are you going to suggest that we uh, get more protein from plants? And if so, take into account that plant proteins actually cause deficiencies. Uh, that's been shown if you look at the fortification documents from the uh, WHO. In almost every case of deficiency, they put it down to a diet that's too heavily based in grain and soy and other uh, phytate containing components of the diet that are actually causing deficiencies that would be remedied just by adding more meat. Um, so I think we need to, uh, w I, just as I wouldn't suggest that we have our intake of clean water, I'm not going to suggest that we have our intake of something that's vitally important. Thanks. Emco. I will be much shorter than that. Um, well, actually, I think we agree on a, a, uh, on a lot of what we both told you. Um, 
and of course we were both taking sides. Well, I was taking sides and I agree actually with a lot of what you say because a lot of my research has also been contra of, on the, well, against carbohydrates and uh, as, as an argument to eat more meat and to eat more protein or eat more fat. And in that view, I would also like to add that, like you were telling, we see a lot of well, cut marks on bones that were found, but I wanted to add that our most, a lot of them are not on brains, but on, on long bones. And what was in long bones, that's only saturated fatty acids. So we were eating a lot of fat, we were getting a lot of energy yeah, we are leaving away now by throwing away the, the well, the, the long bones from cows, or maybe we're using it, but I'm not eating them in my kitchen. So we could still add a lot of energy from eating uh, meat, but I don't think necessarily it needs to be uh, only red meat. I really want to argue that we also ate a lot of uh, fish and a lot of birds. And like you were uh, referring to the, um, the isotope ratios from the... Well, the reference in the paper you gave us from Neanderthals, I don't know whether it was an accident, but we are of course not Neanderthals anymore, but they were really top carnivores. I fully agree on that. And there are more studies on, on, on Homo uh, sapiens species, which had some lower intakes of, of um, well, red meat, and where they were shown strontium and C4 and C3 isotope ratios, which are uh, arguing for an... Uh, uh, reasonable intake of fish foods so i would also suggest that well people realize that the well the amounts you're mentioning for the top carnivore are more neanderthals than we are and well for some reason they got extinct that might have to do with the extinction of the mega uh, flora and i hope we don't want to be part of the extinction of all the remaining flora because we want to continue eating meat Um, yes, it's working again. Um, questions? Yeah, please. We have 10 minutes left, so uh, if you have a question, keep, keep it very short and then... Uh, for uh, Remco, uh, this morning I saw a slide of uh, Jaap Seidel and uh, he said Archidon acid was anti-inflammatory. And... Uh, uh, Archidon acid. And your slide is pro-inflammatory. <laughs> Sorry, my English. So, uh, uh, what about that? I think I saw the slide, and I'm actually, well, I did my PhD on fatty acids, so uh, erythrocytonic is quite uh, pro-inflammatory. Yeah. The only thing you have to, to, to know, which is very important, is that we would not survive without erythrocytonic acid. So it's the most important fatty acids to survive infection. So I am not telling you you don't... Uh, Arachidonic acid is dangerous in any way because if you wouldn't have it, you would not survive infection. So, but there is a reasonable balance between the two. And if we look at the reconstructions of our paleolithic diets, the ratio between the pro-inflammatory omega-6 and the, 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 the anti-inflammatory omega-3 fatty acids was about two uh, or four to one. So four times as much arachidonic acid as omega-3 acid. So more pro-inflammatory than anti-inflammatory. But still, Presently, it's 20 to 1. So we are in a very pro-inflammatory sta uh, state. So I'm not telling you arachidonic acid is bad, but too much arachidonic acid, like everything too much, is bad. Or unhealthy. Okay. Yes, Peter. Smiling already. Yeah. <laughs> you know what's coming. No, no. We're close to okay. Well, uh, the the only thing I want to add, I think both of you made this the same point, is of course, what is the total consumption of everything, uh, especially also arachidonic er 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 acid, in a high carb intake, it's much more pro-inflammatory than in a low carb intake, and we need to recognize that there is so much difference on how we interpret either diet one or diet four or diet twenty, whatever. Uh, because it's the context of everything. And I think the, uh, the same is on saturated fat. You can say saturated fat is bad, is very inflammatory or whatever. But where does the saturated fat come from? It didn't, doesn't come from meat. It comes from the sausage, meat rolls and stuff like that. And not from the meat per se. So I think that's a, a sort of a, just an addition. But I think that's very important to realize. I have one more comment about the arachidonic acid. So part of whether it's going to be inflammatory or not, and you can correct me if you think I'm wrong, but it depends on whether you need the inflammation. So, for example, uh, it's, it's, well, it's been well repeated that if you go on a low-carb diet, 
the levels of arachidonic acid in your blood actually go up. And the theory about why that is is because we don't, uh, we're not using it for inflammation as much. So just because something is there doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to cause inflammation. It may just be that it, it's, it's enabling the inflammation, so it could be a bottleneck to the inflammation, <laughs> so that if you, if you add it, then you can be more inflammatory, but you won't necessarily be if you don't have to be. Does that make sense? It makes sense, yeah, of course. Questions? Yes, Laura? For uh, Remco, actually, so what you s propose is to eat more fish instead of red meat. Uh, but how do you see the, the heavy metal thing? Because if you eat more fish, I mean, there's, there's arsenic, there is a lot of things in fish that are, yeah, just because of the pollution as well. Yeah, yeah, so much. How do you think about that? Uh, yeah, I, of course, I have uh, read about that a lot. Um, well, it is, of course, a problem that especially in, in, well, like it's a food pyramid, of course, also in the ocean. So the big predator fish, they contain the highest amounts of heavy metals. So you really have to not eat big fish like sharks, like um, swordfish, like big mackerels, all the big fish. But actually, if you take a look at how fish consumption is performed nowadays, you see that, for example, well, it's it's decreasing, but you see that they are flying sardines from Chile, so in South America, to Norway to feed the salmon. Well, that's of course very stupid, because why would you, because they use like four kilograms of sardines to produce one kilogram of salmon. Well, you could simply eat the, the sardines, and those are not the ones containing the higher amounts of uh, heavy metals. So what I'm actually doing is walking to the market, well, I live in Amsterdam, I'm a little bit lucky in that way, not for all the pollution overpopulation, but anyway. Um, and I order sardines, and they always ask me, how many cats do you have? <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> most people don't eat very cheap sardines, and you have the anchovies, all these small fish which are very rich in omega-3 fatty acids and low in heavy metals. So you can still f find a way around it if you eat the right fish. And, of course, things are changing. We are cleaning our rivers. So, well, nature is s somehow surviving, and metals are going down. Um, I'm walking over there, but uh, be before I give the, um, I, I would like, I, I, I'm trying to summarize what, what happened here, you know, and wh on what you agree and, and disagree. I wonder, Amber, I think one of his most inter interesting points was the, maybe the second slide, where he showed that, that the, the micronutrients are far more dense in shellfish, etc., while from your uh, talk, I, I got the idea that, okay, everything I need, I, I can get from the red meat. So what's your reaction on that? Uh, thanks for asking. So I do think that it's an unfair comparison if you're not going to include the brain. And um, there, there definitely is evidence that even if it's not happening so much now, that in the past we were carrying skulls back to the, to the sites. Um, on the other hand, my problem with the fish hypothesis is that uh, you have to consider that it's that it's controversial as to whether the evidence supports that there actually was enough fishing during that time, that the time period that we're considering. Um, as far as I understand, it's controversial. Definitely, if we could have had access, that could solve the problem, but it's not clear that we actually did. Or perhaps you have more more different evidence than I have. Well, it's of course, it's the it's the story. I'm not, I forgot the name, but it's the man who found Homo erectus in South Africa, who was really the, like the male predominance in science, like I told you, is that they wanted to have the man, the hunter story. And that has been an ongoing story, like it was man, it was hunting, and that was, that was the good thing. And then it was very hard to, well, to get a new theory in place. And they've been trying on from like 30 years ago, uh, Elaine Morgan, the aquatic ape. Mm -hmm. And it was very hard to find the evidence because mostly the uh, fossils which were found, it was, they said it was found around the water because, well, that's the way they conserve. And it's very hard to find fish bones which have been, well, eaten. But a friend of mine, Jose Jordans, you might, she was the one who published in Nature about even uh, uh, culture which was... Uh, printed into a shell, she is proving and, and finding more and more evidence of very, very early shellfish used, using mostly, and also a fishing. 
So the, the antedating of how long ago we have been fishing is getting back and back in time. It's much diff more difficult to prove. So there is a, a, a much less proof of it, but there, it's increasing. And also the finding of Homo floresiensis. You probably know the small man who lived on the island somewhere in Indonesia, which was in Homo erectus. And he lives on the other side of the Wallace line. And the Wallace line is like the, well, the very sharp, uh, well, uh, uh, gorge into the sea, very sharp. You cannot cross it unless you can, are able to navigate a boat. So they know that Homo erectus, even like how old is Homo erectus, must have been able to somehow navigate the sea. So there is increasing evidence that we were somehow always connected to the water. So I think that it's, it's of course both, but as we are proposing now, and that's what Jose Jordans, my friend, is actually she got a professorship in Maastricht here in, in the Netherlands this year to do more extensive research on the aquatic ape hypothesis and the, well, the, the, that the aquatic diet was actually the thing which made us human and that only Homo erectus like two and a half million years ago, they started to eat red meat on a much higher scale. So red meat is important from two and a half mil million years ago, but the real evolution from ape to man was six, seven million years ago and that was shellfish and fish. It's, it's very interesting that you bring that up, and I completely agree with you that absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence, and that we need to wait and see what will happen. But the reason why I find this particularly compelling and interesting is because I've recently been reading, again, about the, the percussive tool technology to break into brains. Just like uh, you were mentioning that we don't see these knife marks, um, that's because we probably didn't need knife marks. We only needed to smash. And so all this time, the research has been focused on looking for evidence of hunting, and you're going to miss evidence of shellfish and evidence of uh, cracking. Um, and um, there's been recent evidence that cracking into skulls actually goes back to Australopithecus as well. So it could be either or both, because um, there, there was a great, I think maybe a third, uh, Maybe that number's wrong, but there was a there was a huge expansion of brain even in that early period that has to be explained by something. I agree. We're not there, so we're not I, sure. <laughs> I think this is a great moment. We are, we we have to we have to stop anyway. But uh, I think they they prove here that this is real dialogue. You know, <laughs> they're really talking to each other, and uh, so I want to have a big applause for them and. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm.